Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I've based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that with all my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find somewhere to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. Thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. We are going to be talking today about why I'm not a Methodist or a Presbyterian. Why I'm not a Methodist or a Presbyterian, give you things directly from them. Kind of continuing that series we talked about, we had a series that was going on a while back called Five Devilish Doctrines, and we talked about uh, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, we talked about Catholicism. And, you know, Methodists and Presbyterians started off with um, some things that were good, at least they claimed to be. And uh, But we're going to be looking at some of the things. Here's why I cannot walk with a Methodist or a Presbyterian, why I can't fellowship with them. And there's some very clear doctrinal things that I'm going to stand upon. And so I want to thank you for listening today. I'm actually going to be playing a message that I preached just this past September of 2021. And um, it's a message I preached on that exact subject um, to my home church. And um, just thought I'd play that message for you. And And some said that it was a very enjoyable message. They learned a lot of things from it. And so I hope and pray that it will be a blessing to you on that topic of why I'm not a Methodist or a Presbyterian. My friend, will hear well, you'll hear me in the next episode. But until then, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ. Mark chapter 16 tonight. Of course, we talked about, um, we've been doing the series Five Devilish Doctrines, and um, have been going through that and talking about, you know, some of these cults and these false religions, and been going through and talking about some of the false doctrine that they have. And uh, we just finished up with humanism, and we're kind of not continuing the five devilish doctrines. We're going down, and we're going down a different path now. We're going to go through a series, and who knows how long it'll last. It may just be tonight, and then we'll keep going. I don't know. We'll see how long it's going to go. And uh, so preachers is kind of dictating where we're going to go with this. But um, we're going to call this next series, we're going to call it Truth and Error. There's a lot of uh, what you might call denominations. There's a lot of churches out there who they are, they have some truth, but they've got a lot of errors. And so we're going to talk about some of those and take a look in depth that, you know, um, well, let's get into that. If you are a member of Victory Springs Independent Baptist Church, or you're a member of a Baptist church of like faith. Would you raise your hand for me? You are a member of this place or a church of like faith. Amen. All right, you can put your hands down. Some of you were like this. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, get it up there. But, uh, no, um, but, you know, by your testimony and by your membership, By your testimony and by your membership, you claim, if you're a member of Victory Springs, you claim to be, by your membership and testimony, an independent fundamental Baptist. That's what you claim to be by faith. That's what you claim to be. Now, my question to you is, why? And we've asked this question a couple times before. Most of you have sat through our Baptist History Series. We did last year uh, during the summer months of 2020. We did Baptist History. Trace the uh, Baptist lineage all the way from the time of Christ all the way till present day. And so a lot of you would have a, a, a relatively good answer for why you are a Baptist today. But my question more goes along the lines of, and we're not going to do a review of Baptist history tonight, but my question more goes along the lines tonight of, why are you a Baptist and not something else? Why are you a Baptist and not, let's say, a Methodist? Why aren't you a Methodist? Why aren't you a Presbyterian? Why aren't you whatever else may be out there? Some of these denominations that a few of them 
Granted, a small handful, a few of them preach the gospel. Why aren't you one of those? Why are you sitting in this building tonight, not a different building down the street? And frankly, tonight you'd have a hard time finding another building open down the street on a Wednesday night nowadays, just being truthful there. But why are you a Baptist? And so some people would immediately fire back and say, well, that's because God's not with them. God's not with the Methodists. God's not with the Presbyterians. And I would pose this question to you because this question has been posed to me many times. Then how do I answer when I go back in history and look at uh, a couple famous Methodist preachers like John and Charles Wesley? Have you heard of them before? Uh, how do we answer how they preached and why thousands of people got saved? They're, they're Methodist. Uh, how do we go when we answer, we go back just uh, not super long ago and we go back to the sawdust trails of Billy Sunday and tens of thousands walked the alley, got saved, and he was a Presbyterian. How do we answer the Great Awakening where hundreds of thousands got saved under the preaching of George Whitfield, who was a congregational minister? And we say, well, God wasn't with them. Well, how do you see what I'm saying tonight? Why a Baptist and why not something else? Why a Baptist and not a Methodist? Why a Baptist, not a Presbyterian? I want to kind of answer that question tonight, take a look at a couple things. I want to start, and we're going to kind of go in a circle real quick for just a minute for an introduction. The number one thing that people need to hear outside these doors and really inside these doors as well, the number one thing that people need to hear is the gospel. The gospel. Look in Mark chapter, you're supposed to be in chapter 16. I think that's what I said, hopefully. Mark chapter 16. Of course, uh, Brother Jerry Nye just mentioned this verse on Sunday night. Mark chapter 16, look at verse number 15. And he, speaking of Jesus, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. That's everywhere. And preach the gospel to how many people? Every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel is the number one thing people need to hear. They need to hear the gospel. And, and tonight, you being here on a Wednesday night, I know I'm preaching to the Wednesday night crowd. You, you, you know or you should know what the gospel is. It's simply the good news of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's when somebody comes along when they realize, you know what, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to die and go to hell, but I know Jesus Christ came and died for me. He rose again, and if I place my faith and trust in Him, I can go to heaven when I die. That's the number one thing people need to hear. And that's part of the reason God gave us His Word. And so we can have the gospel written plain and clear for us. We can know for sure we're going to go to heaven when we die. Part of the reason the Bible says, uh, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so God gave us the Word of God to get the gospel. But can we just take a look at something tonight? I want you to go and grab, take your, take your Bible in your hand tonight and go and grab the first page of Matthew. Do this, literally. I want you to grab your Bible, just like I'm grabbing it tonight. I want you to grab the, uh, the book of Matthew, and then I want you to go and I want you to grab the book of John. All right? Go all the way. First page of Matthew, last page of John. I want you to do this. Just uh, humor me for a minute. Go and grab the book of John, all right? So grab the first page of Matthew, last page of John, all right? Right there, those four books, we call those four books, we call them the, the Gospels, don't we? The good news, the death, the burial. Here we have four separate accounts of the Gospel, amen? If you can't get it by John, you read Matthew, you read Mark, you read Luke, you read John. If you can't get it by then, I don't know if you're going to get it. But uh, that's the Gospels, all written, four different angles, all the same story, talking about the Gospels. Right there, very clear, we have the Gospels. Now, next to that book, we have the book of Acts, and that just talks about church history. But then we go over, and I want you to go and grab the last page of Romans. All right, go over, take your finger, and grab the last page of Romans. I don't know if there's a book any clearer on the steps to get saved than the book of Romans. I mean, very clear, we call it the Romans road after all. So you got, you got Matthew and you've got Romans. And so here we go. I've got in my hand, I've got the first page of Matthew, the last page of Romans, right there in the first six books. I can tell anybody how they can know for sure they're going to go to heaven when they die from those six books alone. All right, we're very clearly the gospel, how to get saved. And then we'll just throw in Acts, what happens when people get saved. All right, so there we go. Six books right there. Here's my question to you tonight. What's the rest of this for? I mean, I've got a whole lot of other books, and um, that right there is all, you know, that right there, what is all the rest of this for? I mean, there's 66 books in the Bible. If I can get the gospel out of six of them, then why do I need the rest of this? And I'll tell you why. 
for growth, for growth. You need it for growth. When you get saved, you are born into the family of God as a baby Christian. And now that you've been saved, God wants you now as a spiritual baby to grow and to become like his son. By the way, that's the whole point of Christianity. It's not so people will see me, but that when people would look at me, just as that song says, that people would see Jesus in me. I want people when I die one day, I want people at my funeral to not come up here and say he was a good guy or whatever, or he was a bad guy, whatever they thought of me. I want them to be able to say, and this should be your desire. This isn't a thing of arrogance. This is my desire. I want them to be able to say, I saw Jesus in him. That's our desire. We should want to be like Christ. We should represent him. And so now as we begin to, as we are saved, all right, we are saved. Now we begin to grow as a Christian. And how do I grow as a Christian? Well, there's many things I must do. I must read the Word of God. I must pray. I must go to church and be faithful. I must serve. I must be an encouragement. I must obey the commands of God. I need to do those things to grow as a Christian. But the foundational aspect of all those things is that I must take in the Word of God. For that is the food for the baby Christian. I know this is all things you know. We'll get into the meat of the message here in a minute. But that's what I need. I need the food, the spiritual food of the Word of God, the meat and the milk of the Word as God defines it. I need that. How do I get that into my, how do I get that into my spiritual body? Well, one, by personal reading. By personal reading. Each and every Christian in this room should have a time every single day where they read the Word of God. And sadly, there might even be some people in this room who you've been sitting here for a while and you're still struggling with that time. Let me tell you something. You need to get that solidified. You'll never grow. You'll never mature as a Christian until you have that time of personally reading the Word of God. The second way you get the Word of God into your spiritual body is by present hearing of the preaching of the Word of God. You need to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Without it, you will not grow and you will not mature as a Christian. By the way, you need both. You can't just have personal reading. You have to have preaching. You say, well, that doesn't sound right. The Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. It is the power of God. You can't have power without the preaching. You need both. You must have both. You can't survive just off of preaching. You have to have personal reading as well. You get those things into you, and that is what helps to grow and mature you as a Christian. You know what I do? I have a little baby. She's six months old and uh, just turned, well, be six months old tomorrow. Wow, time goes fast. Six months old. And you know, when I go to feed her, we're now feeding her the fruits and the vegetables and the different things and the bananas and bananas and bananas because she doesn't like anything else. And uh, But I've never seen a baby so picky in my life. Now she's getting force-fed everything else, but bananas are her thing of choice. So is our preacher. He still eats the banana baby food to this day. And uh, But you know what I do with that food is I take it and I open up the lid and I leave it on the counter for a couple days and then I know it's really good. Is that what I do? No, because the food spoils, doesn't it? It's become defiled. It's become marred. If I feed that to her, she will never grow like she's supposed to. I have to feed her pure food, food that's good for her, that's going to help her to grow. In the same way, you as a Christian cannot have food that is spoiled, that is marred, that is defiled. Because as you go to churches across the land, you'll come into a church and frankly, they may preach the gospel. But what are they doing after it? That's right. What are they doing to grow Christians from the pulpit? Because here's what's happening in a lot of churches. They're giving you food from the Word of God that has been spoiled by tradition, That's right. by their opinion, by false doctrine. Yeah. And frankly, some people sit in churches who have been in churches for years and they've never matured as a Christian. Why? Because they're being fed spoiled food. That's right. They're being fed spoiled food. So if we can come full circle, we talked about the gospel Here's what we must know. Anyone can preach the gospel and people get saved. Anyone can. I can tell you stories of people who would go out and they would go soul winning and see people saved and then they realized, I need to get saved myself. When we had the Lone Star Tour group here just a, a few months ago, one of those young ladies, she was in Bible college, going to church, helping on a bus route, going, soul winning, all those different things. And then she set the table. But then one day God convicted me and said, you need to get saved. Exactly, week before. People got saved. I, I could tell stories of pastors' wives who, who, who were being an encouragement and being a blessing. And one day they got saved. They realized, you know what? I need to settle this for myself. They led people to the Lord. 
How is that possible? Turn to the book of John real quick. Turn to the book of John. Turn to John and turn to chapter number 12. The Gospel of John. Let's go to chapter number 12. How is it possible? Did I say Big John? Y'all said Big John. Okay. I was like, I don't know what they're laughing at. Sometimes y'all start laughing and it throws us up here. It throws us completely off. In the John chapter 12, look at verse 32. And I, Jesus Christ is speaking. He said, and I, John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now we know from later on in the passage, Jesus Christ is specifically referring to the way he would die. He'd be put up on a cross. He'd be lifted up from the earth. And he said, if that happens, he said, if I die, I will draw all men unto me. I believe, though, I believe there's much to be said that this also points to if we take Christ and we lift him up with the clear and simple gospel, he will draw all men to me. You say, why do you believe that? Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 says, so shall my word be. He says, as it goeth forth, he said, it will prosper in the thing whereunto I've sent it. He said, it will not return unto me void. When we give the gospel clear, simple, and truthful, adding nothing to it and taking nothing away from it, people can get saved whether you're saved or not. Because God promised that He would honor His Word. It's not about who gave it, it's about His Word. I'm telling you, somebody can, somebody can give it who is lost as a goose in a hailstorm, but you know what? They gave it truthfully, they gave it clearly, they gave it simply, and people got saved. So because of the promises of God, it's really no surprise to us that we can go back to the Great Awakening with George Whitfield, a guy who believed in infant baptism and a whole bunch of other things, and, but he preached the gospel very clear and very simply, and hundreds of thousand people, thousands of people got saved and a national revival was sparked, not because of really the man. Which, by the way, if George Whitfield was here today, he'd have a big problem with the congregational churches of today. Just putting that out there. But let me tell you something. It's not about the man. It's about the gospel. In the same way, you go back to uh, famous preacher Billy Graham, who back in, in his younger years uh, could give one of the clearest presentations of the gospel there was. He was very clear back in his, in his prime, you might say. But here's a guy who he had a lot of kooky beliefs. He believed there were aliens on other planets. He said in an interview that this wasn't God's only experiment with life on earth. Um, here's a guy who um, as statistics say that he gave a third of the decision cards of people who got saved to the Roman Catholic Church for them to follow up with. But let me tell you something. He preached the gospel clearly and people got saved. Or Brother Alderman back there, I believe you were listening to him over the radio and it got saved. It produced, why? Not necessarily because of the man, but because God promised the gospel would be effective. Therefore, it's no surprise. So here's the question, and we're working back into that question we started with. Then what about, I know some Methodists, I know some Methodist preachers, and they're a handful, not many, but they're a handful, who preach the gospel. They give it clearly. People get saved. It's exciting. People get saved. I know, I know some Presbyterian preachers by name who they give the, a, a small handful of them, but they give the gospel clear. They, they give it simple. They give it truthful from the Word of God, and people get saved. Yet they come to me and they say, hey, let me preach at your church, and I would say, no way. Yeah. But Amen. why? Why? They, they might come to church and say, hey, let's your church, our church, let's have a meeting together, a joint meeting. We'll preach at each other. It's going to be great. I would say, no way. Right. Why? And the reason why is because of doctrine. That spoiled food we talked about um, just a second ago, what do they give you after you get saved? Which the Bible has so much to say about doctrine, and I've given you so many verses. Write these references down very quickly. Of course, Romans chapter 16, verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. If you go into 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. You know what? Come, at, come up and ask me later for this list of verses, and I'll give it to you. I've got it right here, written in red. And I come up, but we don't have time to give them all to you tonight. But God is very clear. You must be careful about doctrine. In fact, I want you to turn to this one. Turn over to 2 John. Not Big John, as y'all say, but turn over to 2 John. So the second little John. And, um, but 2 John and... Um, Turn to Second John, of course, only one chapter, and look at verse number 10. Here's how serious God is about... 
Here's how serious God is about doctrine, and that's not the right reference. You know, sometimes we write in references, and that's not the right one. Is that? Is that? No, you're right. Second John. Oh, I'm looking in Third John. All right, Second John. You know, sometimes you get on the wrong page. Second John, chapter one. Look at verse number ten. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, what doctrine? The doctrine that the Word of God gives. And bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Have you ever said before when somebody leaves or something, you say, God bless you. Or you have a blessed day. You're wishing them Godspeed. God says if they don't bring to you the doctrine of this book that I've written, don't you dare wish them Godspeed. There's no blessing upon them. That's how serious God is about doctrine. And so frankly, if somebody has a doctrine that's opposite of the Word of God, I can't and I shouldn't walk with them. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no, you can't. You can't walk together unless you be agreed. And so when I come back to that question, and we're going to use kind of Methodist and Presbyterians as an example tonight, I want to put this into practical to where you, or practicality to where you can see it with your own eyes. Here's why I... Here's why I believe when you examine it, why you, if, as a Bible believer, why you can't be. If you want to believe the Bible, why you can't be a Methodist or a Presbyterian. Let me give you a few reasons why. We, it's not just if they preach gospel. It goes back to doctrine. What are the core beliefs that they are teaching to people? If we were to examine some, I think we could go number one to the doctrine of the foundation of the church. The doctrine of the foundation of the church. If you were to ask me... Where was the church founded? Who founded the church? Brother Munson, who would I point to? Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. Both of them answered because I didn't give a first name. They both said the same thing, amen? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly who I'd point to. I wouldn't point back to, to some historical time, the Reformation. I wouldn't point back to some man. I'd point to Jesus Christ. He founded the church on the shores of Galilee, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. I could give you a whole bunch of scriptures for why Jesus Christ started the church. But frankly, Methodists and Presbyterians don't believe that. You say, how do you know? Because their official website says so. If you go to umc.org, unitedmethodistchurch.org, they say this, quote, John Wesley, the historic founder of the Methodist movement. Well, if he founded it, that means Christ didn't. Yeah, come on. They said in an article entitled Our Wesleyan Heritage, they said, quote, Methodism began because of John Wesley, his brother Charles, and others desire to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. Well, if it started with them, then it's not Christ who founded it. And if Christ didn't found it, then it's not His church. Amen. Presbyterians say that John Calvin started their denomination. They say this on one of, their, uh, one of their websites, of course, many different types of Presbyterians, but they say this, quote, Presbyterians trace their history to the 16th century. Did y'all hear that? I said Jesus Christ started the church, and they said Presbyterians trace their history to the 16th century, which means by definition of the language they use, you can't go further back than that. But well, that tells me that's not the church of Christ. They said the 16th century and the Protestant Reformation, our heritage and much of what we believe began with, began with, began with the French lawyer John Calvin. Well, if it began with him, then it didn't begin with Christ. So we could point to the doctrine of the foundation of the church. I could, if we were talking about Methodists and Presbyterians, which we are, I could point to the doctrine of baptism. Some of the things you've heard before, if you ask me about biblical baptism, I'd tell you exactly what the Word of God says, that baptism is done by immersion after somebody has a testimony of salvation. Amen. It's simply an outward expression of an inward faith. It does nothing for our salvation except declare our faith to the world. That's all it does, and it's done by immersion, and it's done after a testimony of salvation. So clearly explained, Acts chapter 8, where Philip was... Uh, the, Remember that eunuch who was, who was riding his chariot, was reading Isaiah 53. That's just a God thing. And Philip said, hey, what are you reading? He said, well, I'm reading this. And he said, hey, let me talk to you about that. And the Bible says he preached unto him Jesus. And he, and he ended up getting saved. And he said, what does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the Bible says they stopped the chariot. They got and they went down into the water. They went into the water. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. They went down the water. Why? Because immersion was needed. So clearly explain Acts chapter 8, verses uh, 30, 34 through 38. Here's what Methodists teach. Methodists teach that a person can be baptized in many ways. In an article entitled, What Do I Need to Know About Baptism? in the United Methodist Church, they said, quote, Does it matter how I was baptized? Whether by immersion, pouring, or sprinkling? No. 
What matters is that you're baptized in water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit by someone authorized to do so. In an article entitled, Why Do We Baptize at Different Ages? They said, quote, at whatever chronological age we are baptized, we are always at that moment babies or new creatures in Christ. I thought the scripture was very clear. We become new creatures in Christ when we get saved. Behold, all things are passed away. All things are become new. But now they're adding baptism to salvation. Here's what it says on the Presbyterian website on an article entitled, What Makes Us Unique? They said, quote, Though a person may be baptized at any age, not biblically, he can't. Infant baptism is a common practice in the Presbyterian church. Parents bring their child to church where they publicly declare their desire for that child to be baptized. On another article, they say this, quote, The water for baptism should be common to the location and shall be applied to the person by pouring, sprinkling, or immersion. By the way, you'll never find pouring or sprinkling in the Word of God. Right. You'll never find them used before the 13th century. Right. You'll never find an infant baby baptized in Scripture. And they'll say, well, what about here? It says the household of Lydia was baptized. There obviously wasn't an infant in it. You have to read it into Scripture. There never, never once do you find where it says, and this baby was baptized. Yeah. Doesn't say it anywhere. All right, so we could go the doctrine of baptism. A Bible believer and a, and a Methodist or a Presbyterian can't walk together on the doctrine of pastors. Did you know that it's a doctrine about who can be our pastor and who can't be our pastor? Right. There's some doctrine there. There's some basic belief. By the way, doctrine is very clear. No gray area. It's black or it's white. There's no gray area. The doctrine of pastors we would disagree on. If you said, hey, what's, what do you believe is a biblical pastor? I'd say, why do you want to know what I believe? Take out 1 Timothy chapter 3 and read it for yourself. Take out Titus chapter 1, read it for yourself in a very condensed version. It's a godly man who meets those qualifications and he's married as well. That's the biblical definition of a pastor to the qualifications and he has to meet those. Presbyterians and Methodists would disagree. The Presbyterians take a different stand on an, in an article entitled, Women. That's literally the article title. Uh, women are a welcome and crucial part of the body of Christ in the Presbyterian Church, USA, which first ordained women as elders in 1930 and as ministers of the Word and Sacrament in 1956. You say, you have a problem with a woman being a pastor? I don't necessarily, in and of myself, not necessarily. I think some women can make some great pastors. I know some women who are way more compassionate than I am. <laughs> and uh, they're great, better people person. I, it's, not that, it's not about me. It's about God. Amen. God said, no, no, no. He said, one of the qualifications for a pastor is that he must be the husband of one wife. And I've got a woman who says she is the husband of one wife. We've got a completely different problem on our hands. But biologically, a woman can never be the husband of one wife. Biologically, that's impossible. So a woman can't be a pastor. But then you got the Methodists do the same. They say this, when did the church first ordain, ordain women? They say, quote, women served as preachers from the beginning of the Methodist movement. They say, same article as below, above, they say, quote, Mary B. Fletcher, who lived from 1739 to 1815, was an early lay preacher credited with convincing John Wesley. Hey, remember that John Wesley we talked about before? John Wesley, that some women should be allowed to preach. Notice what convinced him was a woman, not the Word of God. In an article entitled, Why Does the United Methodist Church Ordain Women? It says, quote, Clergy women have been part of the Methodism since uh, John Wesley licensed Sarah Crosby to preach in 1761. I didn't even know that was a thing back then. But although women are, were ordained in the Methodist tradition as early as the late 1800s, it was May 4th, 1956, General Conference vote for full clergy rights that forever changed the face of ordained clergy. I want to read something to you, just uh, them justifying their stand. In an article entitled, entitled, Commentary, Ordination of Women, they say this, quote, The Corinthian text addresses women keeping silent in church meetings. I turn to 1 Corinthians real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know this passage. Let's turn there anyway. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What are they referencing? What are they referencing? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that definitely is not the right passage on that one. Uh, maybe it's 2 Corinthians. Nope, it's not 2 Corinthians. Who knows where it's at? It's somewhere in here. Chapter 12. Yes, sir, you're right. Nope, not 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's one of these passages in here somewhere. There we go, chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 
My goodness, I'm on a roll tonight. First Corinthians chapter 14. Look at verse number 34. Here's what they're talking about. Read it out loud with me. Here we go. Ready? Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. That's what they're talking about. They said, quote, the Corinthian text addresses women keeping silent in the church meetings. And here's how they answer that. I just want you to hear this. Perhaps the most obvious point in this passage is that it does not even refer to those who are leading the service but only to those who are in the congregation. The point for us in the Corinthian text is that it simply does not address the issue of women in leadership, much less ordination. It is not a text that even applies to the topic in question because it refers only to what the women should do in the audience. Nothing is said of what they may or may not do up front. Can you look at verse 34 again? Let your women keep silence where? In the churches, inside. Uh, that just can't be clear if you ask me. We can't walk together based on the doctrine of churches. We can't walk together, number four, based on the doctrine of salvation. Salvation. We can't walk together. We believe that the Bible says man is saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone without works. And once man is saved, it's the work of God. He's saved until the end of the age. He's saved forever. He's never going to lose his salvation. Romans chapter, 10, Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Of course, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We can't be saved by our works. But then, so clear on the preservation. John chapter 10, and verse 28 says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. It doesn't get any clearer than that, friend. Methodists clearly teach what is opposite of Scripture in the area of salvation. They say, in an article entitled, Do United Methodists Believe Once Saved, Always say, Saved? They say, quote, Can we lose our salvation? A short but very incomplete answer is that our church teaches we can end up losing the salvation God has begun in us. And the consequences of this in the age to come is our eternal destruction in hell. Can I just remind you, John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Of course, Presbyterians do the same thing, except from a little different perspective. They say this, what makes us unique, quote, The doctrine of predestination frees us from speculating about who is saved and who is not. God has already taken care of these matters in the mystery of God's own being. They are Calvinistic in nature, believing that God, before the world began, picked who would saved and who wouldn't be saved. And if you're not saved and you want to be saved, tough luck, you're never getting saved. That's the basic concept of Calvinism. God said that he died for the world. God said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So very clear, we disagree on the doctrine of salvation. But then last but not least, we wouldn't agree on the doctrine of the Word of God. We wouldn't agree on the doctrine of the Word of God. We hold to the Word of God as being inerrant, meaning it has no errors in it. It's our sole authority. There is no other authority that we need. It's our sole authority in all matters. It's as simple as that. We don't need a man to tell us what we believe. We don't need his opinions. We just need the Word of God, plain and simple as it is. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, you know it. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it. And is profitable for doctrine, for approval, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. Here's the danger. Here's the danger of not believing that the Bible is the Word of God, it's inerrant, and it's the only thing we need. You end up with beliefs like the ones we've already talked about. Right. Here's what the Presbyterians, in an article on their website entitled, What Presbyterians Don't Believe, they said, quote, and I want you to listen carefully to these. Don't tune me out yet. Listen carefully. Quote, Presbyterians have always had a very strong doctrine of biblical authority, but historically most have shied away from calling that doctrine inerrancy, meaning without error. Inerrancy is a word that points to complete factual accuracy. It is easy to assume this must be the right word to describe Scripture since it is the Word of God and therefore must not have any mistakes in it, but this reasoning does not quite work. I don't know why it doesn't. The Bible says that the Word of God is settled forever in heaven. It's a pure word. Every, all of it is inspired by God. Methodists say this in their articles entitled Commentary, Why Do United Methodists Ordain Women? And uh, we talked about this in just a minute ago, but I want you to get their reasoning. Here's why they can justify it. They said, quote, Methodism's founder, John Wesley, believed that the living core of the Christian faith was revealed in Scripture, illuminated by tradition, vivified in personal experience, and confirmed by reason. 
Wesley's position and the position of the United Methodist Church is that Scripture is primary. If we continued on, I, I want you to listen very clearly. They said one reference from Paul. One reference from Paul may appear to rule out the ordination of women, but United Methodists also take into account other scriptural references, as well as our tradition, experience, and reason. That's how they arrive at the conclusion. There are no scriptural references that disagree with what Paul said. They just go to their tradition and their reason to try and justify it. When you begin to include tradition, you'll never, never agree with scripture. I want you to listen very closely. This is the last quote I'll give you. They say, quote, from Methodist beginnings, the Bible has been the chief source for reaching most decisions in our church. John Wesley gave it first place among the resources to which we should turn in reaching important decisions about Christian belief and practice. But this is what they say about their founder. But Wesley did not make it the sole source, nor did he believe the text of Scripture to be the literal word of God. He believes serious Christians will always read the Bible using the insights of tradition, reason, and experience. While the Bible is still our chief instrument in, the, in that quest, it is not the only resource at hand. We believe that the Holy Spirit continues to lead, revealing God's will in ways that previous generations may not have discerned. As we face new, new situations and qu questions of critical import in our time, on some matters we believe that we understand more clearly God's will than Christians of previous generations. By the way, you read the article in context, those Christians of previous generations they're referring to were the writers of Scripture. They said, we know the Word of God more clearly. We know it more clearly because of all we've been through. They didn't know some of these situations that were going to come up, so we are, we are more clear on it. That's how you arrive at all these different conclusions. Just frankly, as a Bible believer, a Methodist and a Presbyterian, and me, we cannot walk down the same road together. I mean, I can walk down the sidewalk and be cordial. I mean, doctrinally, we can't walk down the same road together because their, their beliefs are so opposite from what the Word of God says. Because even though a handful of them may start with the truth, the gospel, all they build on top of it is error. And you may say, you may say, well, you know, I know a Methodist very, very well, or I know a Presbyterian very well, and they don't believe some of the things you just mentioned. They believe in baptism by immersion. They believe in some of these other things. You know, I met a Democrat one time at the Florida State Capitol. A Democrat one time at the Florida State Capitol was in her office, and she told me, I told her I wanted to pray with her, and she told me, she said, I will have you to know that I am against abortion. I looked down on the nameplate and said, Democrat, and uh, it was still there, and she said, I'm against abortion. You know, even to this day, I still have a hard time believing her. You know why? Because the party platform she signed and she stands upon loves and supports abortion. It's time, if she really stands against it, it's time to change parties. I'm sorry, you may know a Methodist or a Presbyterian who doesn't agree with everything I just said that they believe from their own websites. But let me tell you this, if they don't, it's time to change parties because you can't continue to say, I don't believe that, and still stand with them because the doctrine does not match up. Why am I a Baptist and not a Methodist, not a Presbyterian? I'll tell you why. It's not just about the gospel. That's the number one thing. But it's about what am I feeding people after? What am I giving to you? Am I giving you spoiled food or am I giving you the pure Word of God? And that's going to dictate what I do when I look at churches. Hey, I'm very careful. Let me tell you something. I don't go on Facebook and share just any preacher who says something good and like, wow, that was good, that was yeah. great. Because they may have said something good in that video, but the video to follow, yeah. my friend, it may have something that's spoiled food. Be very careful, very careful. Doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. We must look at the doctrine.